So, Jay described this as a presentation, or yeah. this is, I'll call it participatory presentation. So, as much as you might be here to listen to me, I'm, I'm here to listen to you. Uh, and we're going to play a bit of a game, which is <clears throat> it's called You're the Product Manager. So, I'm going to, I have a few slides I'm, I, want, I want you guys to sort of give feedback on. And then I have essentially. <coughs> going through my career, a bunch of situations that I was in as a product manager, and I'm going to lay out you know, what the situation was, and I want you guys to participate, I want you guys to, you know, you can ask questions, and if you need some information, what about this, what about that, what about that, and then I want you guys to propose, uh, here's what we do, or, and then I'll show you what happened, and hopefully that, that's a good learning experience, okay? So, so I, and one more thing, so this is my first trip to Sydney, and I was not to see Australia, and I've learned a lot about. And one thing that people say about Brisbane and Sydney and Melbourne is that Brisbane is low energy. And I don't think that's true, but I want you to prove it to me that it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> All right, because because otherwise I'll go, yeah, they're right. So how many of you are product managers? Okay, keep your hands. Up. That was a low energy hand. <laughs> All right. how, how, many, how many of you want to be product managers? Okay. <laughs> okay, the people who have, do not have their hands up, why are you here? Okay, no, it's okay. Um, so I, I'm going to just walk through this. So, yeah, as Jay said, you know, I've been in product management 20 years. I actually gave a talk last year uh, in Toronto at a product tank, and uh, the host, you know, the Jace equivalent in Toronto, his name's Kylie, he's a good guy, he said, hey, how should I introduce you? And I said, well, I'm working at this company, and um, I've not been in product manager for all. He goes, how long have you been in product manager? And I said, oh, wow, uh, it's 20 years. He goes, oh, perfect. And so he introduced me, he says, this is Saeed, and he's going to give a talk, and he's been in product manager for 20 years. And so I gave him a talk, and then half the questions were about my talk, and half the questions were from, and this is a bit of a more mature crowd than the one in Toronto, but they were like, You've been doing that for a long time. <laughs> what was it like back then when you got in? Yeah. <laughs> and and one, one person came up to me and he's like, oh, that was great talk. I go, thanks. He goes, you've been doing this 20 years? I said, yeah. And he goes, you're like the godfather of product management. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, 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 when I was leaving, I called my wife and said, I'm officially old. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's get started. So I already did a bit of, you know, about you. How many people have been to a product tank before? <coughs> How many have never been to one? Wow. Well, thank you. <laughs> All right. So now let's talk about me. Um, so I, as you know, I've been in, doing this a long time. I've been here in Brisbane for two, in uh, Australia for two weeks. Um, right now, I've, I've worked in a lot of software companies, and we'll go through that as as, as we go through the talk and. The last couple of years I've been doing consulting and sort of helping software companies with their product and product management issues. And, and I'll say, as I look back, except for the early days when I was in product management, for me this is the best time because I'm actually learning more helping people than mm -hmm. I've been learning <laughs> helping my boss or whatever it was. <laughs> Nothing against bosses. Um, so I, when, 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 when I did that talk last year, uh, and I kind of realized I'd been doing this 20 years, I was like, wow, let me, and I kind of did an assessment, and, and so I just said, you know, 40,000 hours, if you say, you know, 10,000 every five years, and then I actually went through and counted up all the product releases I did, and it's somewhere around 43, uh, about 16, like, individual products, launched six. This is the statistic that blew my mind. I didn't realize I traveled that much. So that's like to the moon and back. And, and this trip, actually, I've gone beyond the moon now. Um, I don't know how many customer conversations I've had. I mean, it's probably in the hundreds. Uh, I've fought far too many fires. Uh, I don't know how many of you spend your time doing firefighting, but it's the thing that you, you don't want to do, but you end up having to do. And, and I don't feel I've gotten enough recognition for my efforts. <laughs> and, and I think in a way product managers, in, in some ways it's a thankless job because if everything goes right, it's like, yeah, you did your job. 
But if something goes wrong, it's like, well, it was a product manager's fault. <laughs> You're doing great now. You're doing great. All right, thank you. <laughs> My people at the back. <laughs> so this is a question I, I if I'm, I'm interviewing or if I'm giving a talk, I always like to ask this question. So, so this, is, this is the first part where the energy needs to come, okay? So who wants to answer this question? All right. <laughs> Herding cats. Wow, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anyone else? Who? Him? He'll answer it. He'll answer it, yes. I think if you know what it is, not that it should be. Well, it's what, what is the, it? The Gantt chart of product ownership. The, sorry, the what? The Gantt chart of product ownership. The Gantt chart of product ownership. <laughs> it's harsh, but that's what I see. Okay. Right? What does that mean? What does that mean? I, like, oh, do you know, like, uh, I know what a Gantt chart is. I, oh, okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, developers are supposed to a question. Yeah, it's it's uh, uh, an ordered procession of things. Maybe it doesn't quite reflect reality. Okay. Uh, your Gantt chart only gets longer. Um, that sounds like a parade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a product. Okay. I don't think that's what you should be. Anyone? Okay. Um, Second time. Yes. It's the mismatch between. Um, what your product is and what the customer is expecting. Okay. And how to <clears throat> deal with that okay. expectancy. Okay. And anyone else? Anyone in, have been in product management for 10 years or more here? Why aren't you answering? PTSD. I'm sorry? PTSD. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know anymore. Okay. Yeah. At the back? Uh, I was going to say making sure you're solving the right problem, solving them in the right way. Okay. Good. Good. So, um, so, the, so I, I, I did a workshop in City of Melbourne as part of the conference, and part of the thing I did was like a pre-workshop little survey so I can understand uh, the audience. Um, fancy that, right? So uh, this is what some, some of the people said. So the, there, are, there are a lot of answers. I picked a couple of good ones. So it's the other balancing product needs with sales development and marketing mm -hmm. for the benefit of the customer. So, you know, it's not bad. Tell me what it is. <laughs> I'll, I'll share the deck if you know, oh, at least. Right. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> Most of it will be completely useless to you because it's about me. Uh, <laughs> Sophie's trying to do uh, you and use uh, product management actually. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. myself. So it's the understanding what problems should be solved in what order from a point of view that takes into account business and customer value. Yeah. So, you know, not bad. So, so then there's this guy. <laughs> you know, I should have worn a black shirt. Um, so this is, this is kind of the definition I use, and, and it's a bit of a mouthful. It's a cross-functional business and technology man management focused on creating and delivering products that meet or exceed their business goals and objectives. So a bit of a mouthful, but there's sort of key parts there. So first of all, cross-functional, right? So it's, it's in our blood. Like we, we work across groups and across teams, and, and we're not kind of focused on our silo. For technology, for software, it's business and technology management, right? So if you're a, a product manager in a pharmaceutical company or something, you're not in the lab with the scientists, you know, fiddling with the, the drugs or anything. You're, you're pretty much a business manager. But for us, I don't know how it came about, but we're fiddling with the drugs. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in creating and delivering products, so it's both, right? So again, you know, the traditional product management role is about delivering the products, right? This pharmaceutical, things get produced, and then it's about going to market, so but we're doing both. And then the one that, that I always stress is business goals and objectives. Mm -hmm. Like it's, we're doing this because it's a business, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not doing this because it's a, a hobby and it's technology and stuff. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of product managers I've seen, their roles are defined very strictly on the technology side, you know? I work with engineers, and yeah, once in a while I figure out what's going on in the world, but I'm focused on the engineers. So this is my, my view. Um, and then you can't have a present, yes? Sorry, I had a question. If, um, if product management is design technology business, where was design in that uh, Product management isn't necessarily design. So desi design is a discipline, is a required, well, okay, so I know there's the Martin Erickson uh, Venn diagram which is different from this, and he's got UX technology and customer or market or something like that. Um, so as a product manager, I may be involved in the design part of it, but I'm not a designer, right? There's people who should be designing, right? Like I, I tell my kids, because they, you know, they used to ask what I do, 
And I say, well, I don't, I don't write the software, I don't sell the software, I don't market the software, but I make sure all those things are done the way they should be done. Um, if you want to be kind of a little, you know, like pigeonholing it, it would be in that creating, the word creating, right? So creating involves a lot of things, and, you know, I would put it in there. So yeah, this is the Venn diagram. So the way I look at it is, you know, it starts with business objectives. Everything we're doing is that uh, intersecting with market needs, product capabilities, and then the last one, which a lot of people don't really think about, is organizational alignment, which is really, you can build the best product, if you can't get it to market, and you can't all get behind it and do what's needed, then you're not gonna be successful. Um, and and it's, it's, it's interesting that a lot of people that have been in product management, they get this, they get this, they get a little bit of that, but they don't focus as much on this. Um, and, and you see it all the time. You see it all the time where you know companies say like you know marketing sales are not aligned, or you know the product does something and people don't understand it. Uh, Elon Musk, yes, sir. Oh, sorry. No, go on, go on, go on. Where would you see organization around uh, like commercial law and commercial law moves and things like that, or, or further away from that? Sorry, I didn't. I didn't hear the. Oh, I uh, so Conway's law and then versus oh, Conway's law. Conway law maneuvers. Uh, so, it, and so I remember which one is Conway's law. Is it about the communication? Which oh, one's how, Conway's law? Uh, uh, your, the architecture of what it is you're creating. Yes, is, is the communication. The yes, is 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 reflects the communication structure of yeah. the organization. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so there's this law called Conway's law, and if you're not familiar with it, it, it I think it's absolutely true. Which is, it says that like when you're building something, and software is fairly complex, it it will be a reflection of who's talking to who in the company. So if you're you know if you're not talking to someone, you don't know what they need, and then it's not gonna you know. Be in. So um so yeah, that that's sort of the the bad side of the organizational alignment. But yes, you want to you want to avoid those gaps. So the way I look at it is this, and I was gonna kind of address that. So um, Elon Musk has a quote. It's some like you know every employee is a vector, right? And a vector has magnitude and direction. And you want to align those vectors in the same direction so everyone's heading towards the same, same goal. And, and that's, to me, what organizational alignment is, is that you know, when we build a product, we build it for a certain purpose, and we've done our market research, and we understand what's going on out there, and then we want to make sure that the other groups all go out in the same direction. Because if that's true, then you're going to magnify your results. So I'll give you a story in that. Um, in California, when I worked there, it's, I think 2005, and we had this new feature uh, in the product. So it was an information management company. Any, anyone work with databases and things like that? Yeah. Some of you, okay, good. So, so you know, like you can send SQL down the database and execute it. And so we had this technology that could take sort of an abstract representation of a query, turn it into SQL, and then distribute it wherever it would go, and then get the results back. And we called it push down optimization, because you could push the query down to wherever it was. And in some cases, it was really, really fast. But it wasn't always fast. But the, the benefit of it was we would generate all the SQL for you. And we were very explicit to our marketing people that these are, what, these are the use cases, and this is why it's important. And it is not a performance feature. And then at our annual conference a few months later, our CEO is on the stage, and he's introducing this new release. And he talks about push down optimization, and then he says, This feature can be up to a thousand times faster than this alternative. And all of us were like, <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, that's, that's the bad side. But it, it really means that the vectors, you're all going in the same direction, you all understand what the context is, and you're moving forward. So, question? Yeah, question. <laughs> okay, so first question. Who said question first? I'm just helping him. Oh. <laughs> um, if, you go, if you go back to the slide, you, you represented all those um, four circles being equal size. This is not a mathematical expression. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, the focus of any business is the customer. He lives in the market needs. Um, the intersect between the organizational alignment as in serving the customer and, and the market needs seems to be the, by far the most important area to me, and that is where any business will 
what its emphasis in terms of me being a product manager and having to <coughs> see what what what. What, what products does the market need? What have yes. we got? Yes. What can we adapt, move, and into that space? And so what does the market need, right? What product should we deliver that address that? Yep. How does that align with our business objectives? Well, business objectives will change. Yeah, but this is not static because <coughs> market needs change, products change, right? Mm -hmm. But it's the market needs, what, what, how we fulfill that. Sorry, I'm in your way, but... Uh, what are our business objectives, and then how do we align the organization yeah. to achieve those objectives? There's a certain hierarchy within those things, and it all leads to satisfying the customer, earning profits, um, being able to develop a business, etc., yeah. etc., etc. Yeah. Et um, so, I, 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 I are we are we debating, or are you? <laughs> no, 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 I, I agree with you, but I'm just saying there's yeah. an emphasis in. In, in, in the customer. Yes, absolutely. So again, this is this is uh, how can I say this is diagrammatic. It's not yeah, repre sure. it's not representational. And and this changes. People understand that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Just so I better understand how you're defining organizational alignment. Yes. What would be some of the some examples of the biggest challenges that you had to face? Um, so well, so that example I gave about how marketing was positioning this particular feature is one because then obviously that drove some specific kind of demand that we couldn't fulfill, right? And we had to undo that. Yeah, because I, I was just right. thinking I had to do a technical matrix for product management at my last yeah. organization, and I found a couple of sources that said you know your highest level they're good at the organizational side, so they can influence high-level execs, yeah. they, they actually know how an organization should be structured and yeah. function, yeah. how a development team should yeah. be structured. Yeah. Um, is that the sort of stuff you're, you're talking about? Yeah, so there, there's sort of the organization that you have and then it, what they're working on and how they're moving forward together, right? So as an example, when sales and marketing aren't aligned, you get problems, right? They're both busy, they're both doing things. We had cases, in, and again, it's another informatic case, in, where we had certain, uh, how can I say, we had, we had certain targets in terms of who would be the right customer profile for a certain product. And yet marketing was kind of mass marketing this, if you want to call it that. And then we get all these leads. And then, you know, 60% of them were, were just wrong. But then sales was falling up and, you know, how much time was wasted. So, you know, it's, that's a classic example, but it's just any sort of uh, situation where you're, you're at cross purposes or you're going in different directions, right? And that's why that vector, I like that vector analogy because it's, you know, your effort plus the direction you're going. You can be going in opposite directions and you're, you're wasting your time. The, the cross purposes and picking up the cross purposes is a very, very, very important yes. Um, so, Okay, this wasn't supposed to come in. So the goal of product management, so this is another question I asked, but I, was, I didn't realize it was going to show. I asked people, what's the goal of product management? And people say things about to build the right product and to do this and to do that. And my view is, it's, it's my goal as a product manager, because I said, I don't build it, I don't sell it, I don't market it, but I'm, I, my goal is product success, right? That's my goal. I want these, this to be successful, and that's my responsibility. And then I, I add this through all stages of the product life cycle, because when you say product success, the first question is, well, what does success mean? And the answer is it depends, right? Depends on many things. In an early stage, you're, you're maybe looking for initial customer adoption, right? Or even earlier, you're trying to validate things. Maybe later, you're looking for revenue. Maybe later, you're looking for profitability. Maybe later, you're looking at churn or retention or things, right? So depending on the maturity of your product, the maturity of the market, what your goals are, it, it, it varies. But, but in the end, in my view, it's this, and that aligns with your business objectives, and that's why I always start with business. Okay, you're nodding, so I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you're 10 years. Anyone else with 10 years of experience? No one's going to raise their hand. <laughs> okay, so we got about 40 years, 50. So, I'm going to just take a guess. On average, there's about five years per person of product experience in I know, 50 people here, so five times 50. We have two and a half centuries of product knowledge. <coughs> so, so my next question should be easy. Yes. Yeah, it was, it was funny when you asked that question, because when I thought back, 
a lot of my previous roles probably were product management, but yeah. we didn't really know what to call it. Yes. We just said, what do you want to call yourself? Okay. Can, can you do these things? Okay, so 260 years. <laughs> so, who can name all the stages of the product life cycle? Not you. No, let's give someone else a chance. But we'll come back to you. Okay, yes. Um, development. Okay. Um, sales, like promotion. Okay. Yes, not literal, but... That's an action, but okay. Let's keep going, keep going. Um, growth. Okay. Maturity. Okay. Decline. Okay. Go for a ride. <laughs> That's very good. Four out of five. Four, well, you got almost five out of six. Okay. Yes. Early adopters. Uh, that's the stage of a market versus stage of the product, but she's, like, if yeah. I add candy or something, you can yeah. Exactly. There is. There is. There is. There's a... <laughs> <laughs> the you and you means. Oops. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Thank you, you and you. Is your public liability okay? Yeah, yeah. 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 You guys have health insurance, right? Yeah. You're like Canada. Yeah. Uh, okay, no, that, that was very good. And I'll tell you something, though. This is the first time someone individually has mm -hmm. rhymed off five of them correctly. Mm -hmm. In most cases, uh, you get a spattering of this, uh, growth and this and maturity. And so here's the thing. This is, this, is, this is kind of what you read, something like that, right? So end of life is last one. So here's the question. Why is this so hard? Why is it like you have to think about it? Because it's different for each product. No, this is not different for each product. This is standard. Mm -hmm. It's about the nature of each of them. Is it that the but focus just, is more on developing and launching and they don't consider what happens afterwards? That's, that's close. That's not bad, yeah. yeah. Okay. I think the transitioning between the phases is quite challenging. I think you okay. need that experience. You need to have been okay. through it. But just, I'm just saying, why is, it, why is it hard for people to just go, here, this is what it is? So, I, I, I think that every business needs to have a number of products at each of the stages and be okay. developing and moving sure. forward. Sure. Okay, but that's not the question. Sorry. Okay. Uh, the question is, why is it that you guys didn't all know, here's the six stages because we're all product people and this is what we do? So, yes. Uh, it, is it because the um, most of the products that worked on are, are like the first three and don't yeah, sort that of transition yeah, something and grow like, into yeah. Anyone else? Yes, yeah, so I was in games and we used Lean Startup, so yes. it's similar but different mm. terms okay. and different things. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, there's no real formal training for most of them. Okay. I, I, I yes. question I've also thrown because most people don't care about any of them. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. You get candy. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sorry. No, please. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, really, it, this is utterly useless because it has no applicability to what we do. Yeah, we develop and we launch and stuff, but nobody thinks about what does maturity mean? What does that mean, mm. right? Like in, in, in practical terms, what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. It, it, it's, it's, I, I, I disagree, it's not utterly useless. It is <coughs> well, an indication it, it, of the it, revenue you're sure. going to get from these products. This is academic well, and it's, yes. it, it's fine for a definition, but in, in terms of applicability, we don't really think about it. True. But that doesn't mean that the life cycle is useless. So I look at it as the names in, of the stages don't matter, but the objectives of mm -hmm. each stage matter. Yeah. Because the objectives will then drive your behavior and your actions and goals. Okay, so I'm not going to ask you for what are these, because you probably haven't <coughs> heard it, and I have a little mnemonic, and, and I'll, I'll put it up. And I'm going to ask you, this is part of that high energy part that's going to come up again. And I'll tell those Sydney folks, they don't know Brisbane. So, yeah. so, so repeat after me. Build it. Build it. Nail it. Scale it. Extend it. Milk it. Milk it. End it. End it. Okay. One more time. Okay. So if you do it three times, you'll never forget it. And I'll tell you, that was great because I did a, a talk in Melbourne at Product Tank. And they weren't even close. <laughs> so these are the objectives, yes. Just another comment. I think the other reason why this is really not relevant is because a lot of the time, this is very straight line, right? Like when you're starting from zero and you're building up. But then once you already have your product, you're kind of looping between maturity, decline, 
and then yep. no. back to square one. Yeah. You're kind of cycling between. Yeah. Sometimes you're in, you're not going in their orders. Exactly. No, that's absolutely true. Uh -huh. And no, that's I true. think that's why it doesn't really. Yeah. Well, you, you, but we're not like you're right. You're cycling back and forth, but mm. there's no real connection between this word or this word in what I'm doing in my job, mm. right? That's right? And so when you look at this in objective, like. I'll explain what these are in a sec, but these mean something and they, they will drive behavior. The, like the business objectives that build it and nail it are very different than the business objectives here, right? And, 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 and you need different staff and you need different mentalities to do each Yeah, you need to think different. But there's a fixation. Yeah, sorry. That there will be a fixation on a business, a, a startup, sure. to go through the cycle, but not on the next cycle or the next yeah. cycle. Yeah. And, and there needs to be that. Yes. We get at the back. Who the hell nails it the first time? I'm sorry. Who the hell nails it the first time? <laughs> uh, let me explain it. Let me explain it. Okay, yes. This is this is the objective. It's not the thing that you do. Right? It's the objective. Yeah. Are we finding now with a lot of big plays that um, we're locked in the extended cycle? As yeah. in, um, yeah. get Microsoft, Google, um, okay. Facebook, okay. and so on. You're, you're going to steal my extra. thunder. <laughs> <laughs> No, you're, you're, you're absolutely right, but so, 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 it's really useful. <laughs> um, so yeah, so, so do you point at the back? So build it, you, you, you know, you've, you've kind of done research, you build something, and it's, it should be very targeted, specific use cases or specific audience or something like that, right? And then nail it is, you, you, you work to identify and remove barriers for wider adoption. Like you, you get those things right and really right, and you remove efficiencies, and you, you really know, okay, yeah, we started with this, but this is where we're going forward, right? So that's nail it. And then scale it is, scale the business, scale the product, scale, you know, sort of the overall picture that you're going for. And so you could be, instead of scaling business, you could be scaling your org, or you could be scaling the product as well to yeah. take on more. A lot, lot of startups file in that. Yes, yeah, so there's now terms scale up and a lot of people are sort of, how do we, how do, we do it? We, we figured out for, you know, small customers. Extended is move into new markets, new segments, solutions, etc. Uh, milk it, you know, this is the cash cow kind of stage, right? So you're, you're, you're trying to extract as much profit as possible and end it as end of life. And, and the thing is that, I'm going to give you a few examples, right? So Dyson, anyone have a Dyson vacuum? <laughs> I love my Dyson vacuum, <laughs> and, and I feel so weird saying that because it's a vacuum. That's beautiful. Um, so this is James Dyson, who looks really much a lot like Tim Cook in my opinion, <laughs> um, especially from the back row, probably. So they started with this, and that's the model I have. I bought it like 13 years ago, and you know I paid what I thought was a ridiculous amount of money for it. Um, and then they scale up, right? So build a, he, he figured out his, uh, his you know, 5,000 whatever prototypes and got the vacuum and got the market. And then they scaled the business, they went global. They got all, you know, the canister back and the hand back and stuff. And, but he's still in the vacuum business, right? And then he said, oh, well, we're dominating the vacuum business. Let's get into other businesses, right? So it's extending it into new markets. Like, I'll pay $500, well, I did. I paid $500 for Dyson vacuum. I won't pay $500 for a fan. I, I don't know who's buying those. Um, <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. Okay. They're not buying them. <laughs> they don't buy But they, they've extended out their markets, right? And, and, and someone told me they released something else recently. A new light. Really? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The hair dryer, curling one, and hair straightener. Yeah, so this yeah. is the hair dryer. Seven hundred dollars. Yeah, this is, this is the hair dryer, the hand dryer. So anyway, yeah, so they're they're moving on. Yeah. And, then, and, and the thing is that these things then, right, when you extend it, these things go into the life cycle again. Because you know, now they've got lots of different fans and lots of different hand dryers and things. Uh, oops, sorry. <laughs> Wrong way. Milk it. So these things, you know, they sold boatloads of them. They, and then they end of life the one I have, which is this one here. Right? So that's one example. Another example, which you guys should be familiar with, is, is Chobani yogurt. Yes. Oh, yeah. So they started in the U.S. and I went to the U.S. and I loved it. I, uh, we don't have any Canada it's political issues, but you know this guy who started and, and there's this this there's a really good thing if you go on the HBR site and you look for Trevani, there's a really good article about how he started and what he did. 
And he wanted to, he wanted to have the yogurt like he had in Turkey. And he, uh, he I guess he had money because he bought a yogurt factory hmm. that was being shut down. Uh, but then what he did was he hired a yogurt master from Turkey to come, and he spent three years perfecting their yogurt formula. In the meantime, he was doing contract yogurt production for other people. And then once they figured it out, he launched Shabani Yogurt. And, and it wasn't just the, the yogurt. He made a lot of smart decisions in terms of how to, like even the shape of the, of, the, yeah. of the container and all these things. So they got their yogurt, and then they scaled it, and then they extended it, and then now they got all these things, kids' yogurt and drinks and all that stuff. Um, oops. Oh, yeah, so he's only at the extent stage, and this is no pun intended because it's yogurt, but <laughs> there's no, he, he hasn't gotten that stage yet. Um, and then the last guy, and this is why, sorry, I was like, you're still in my thunder, because there's this, this kid. And they started with Microsoft Word, and then they got Office, and then they got all this other crap. Like, I, I don't know, <laughs> like, Outlook, and Keynote, I don't know what the hell that is. Um, and then there's all this, then, you know, they've been updating icons every couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Like, I don't know what else they do. Where's Internet Explorer? Huh? Where's Internet Explorer? It's not part of Office. It's yeah. <laughs> um, but they have end of life some stuff, so I don't know what these are. I've never used them, but there were things in Office in some editions, and they got rid of them. But, but you know, again, so three examples of just, that's the pattern you follow. So, so now this is me, and this is, I, I actually mapped it out, like, these are the products I worked on, they have dumb names like acronyms and whatever, don't worry, I'll talk about a few of them. But I, worked, I realized I worked on stuff that was all across. The colors are kind of from the same company, so there's some companies where I had a lot of products and some where I had one or two. Um, and I, I emitted a couple of products, but anyway. So now, now we get into you're the product manager. So I'm going to go through sort of a timeline and I'm going to just ask quickly questions about things. So my first, I haven't been a product manager since 1989, but my first exposure to product management was 1989. Uh, anyone heard of Alias? I know one person has. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it probably, you probably haven't heard of it. It was a, a really amazing Toronto 3D graphics company in the, in the 80s and early 90s. Um, and they went public on the NASDAQ, and, and they were very successful. But you do know their work. So anyone seen the abyss? Right, so their software was used for this, the, you know, the water thing. Anyone saw Beauty yeah. and the Beast? So this scene was, you know, it's a Disney movie, but they used the alias of software, but this scene was a mix of computer animation and traditional, and, and Disney actually won an Academy Award for, for effects. And then you guys have all seen this, so this is, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff. But it, like, it was great at the time to be working this company, and we're doing, you know, it was like, hey, the software that I work on, like, you, you know, because because I've worked on like enterprise software, and nobody cares. <laughs> oh, James. Cameron. No, no, no. I know two of the movies are James Cameron movies, right? Yeah. No, it's not. It was it was a it was a company in Toronto, and it, it went public, and but James Cameron is Canadian. You know that, right? So, um, I think Canadians are like Australians that way. We always like to tell people about things from our country, <laughs> especially, especially when you're in another country. Oh, you know, he's Australia. <laughs> um, and then, but this is the other side of their software, and it's the same software as, as industrial design, right? So, so this is it. So, Alias at the time had a single product called Alias. Um, it was used for animation and industrial design, and so essentially Hollywood and Detroit were the kind of two big centers of focus. And they had a lot of questions, like who are we building for? How do we define a clear product strategy? You know, how do we maximize value? All right? So that's the question. You're the product manager. This is the situation. Company's hot. We're selling stuff. Ford and GM and Toyota and, you know, all these studios are buying it. But we have this big monolithic product. What do we do? Yes. Split it into two. Yeah. Into two. Okay. Good. Anyone else? Just diversify. Diversify. Well, okay. See who your competitors are. See okay. what you can focus. Okay. Focus on small set of customers. Okay. Anyone else? Look at consumer market. I'm sorry. Consumer market. Consumer market. Okay. This is 1989. Remember, they're 1990. So we had like PCs running in the megahertz. Yeah. Yeah. Kill the house. 
My PC was 4.77 megahertz. <laughs> Sorry. Is there like an anti twenty thing going on here? Like, like where, where are most of the companies and uh, where is most of the companies? Yeah. Okay, no, that's a, that's a good that's a good question. Is one bigger than the other? At the time, both of them were growing, right? Like, you know, industrial design software used to be called CAD software, right? Computer design. And, but it was really taking off. <clears throat> And then the Hollywood stuff was taking off. Like Tron was a few years earlier and then blew up everything. And then there's a, a bunch of other movies. I was going to get the push Hollywood to get to Troy. <laughs> <laughs> so you were in the growth phase and really whatever the next phase was, I can't remember off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have to use, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm sorry, you have to use the right words. It was the, the, the internet is coming. Scale it phase. Yeah, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, well, this is pre internet, but yeah. So, what did Alias do? And I was a tech, by the way, I was not a product manager. I was a technical writer. So I knew the product. We had one, like a thousand pages of docs. So they hired a product, a product manager from Procter & Gamble because you know, there were no technology product manager at the time. He was actually, do you guys know what Crisco is? Crisco, Crisco shortening? He was like the product manager for lard. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and people kind of made fun of him. But he was smart. He was really smart. So this is what you did. And so you know you had it right at the back. But it wasn't two, it was four. So what they did was they actually segmented it by industry, and then they also looked at the, the roles and things like that. So we had animator, power animator, so there was sort of light version, heavier version, there was designer, which was the industrial design, and there was studio, which was sort of most of the above, and then we had options. Right? And so, you know, the job I had was had to redo all the docs. Um, but, you know, this was a huge success, huge success for the company, because why? Why was it successful? Anyone? They built products that different people need to them. Right. Yes. Right. Right. Also, yes, go to market, exactly. So, it brought focus, right? Instead of going, we've got this big monolithic thing, and you know, we use this part, and we'll do this, and we'll do that. It was really focused, right? Marketing, positioning, messaging, everything was great. Understood your target markets. And this, so this, and, and I'm learning at this point, right? I'm young in my career. I think I was like 25 or something. Um, you know, specialization is good. Like, you know, some of you think, oh, the more the better. It's a Swiss Army knife, right? But it's not. It, it doesn't work that well. And then, you know, and this is something I learned. Value can be increased even when functionality is decreased, right? And, and that's that's a, I think that's a, a, a takeaway that I think we can still apply today, because you know, a, a lot of times we're all about feature, 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 and it should be the other. Okay. Target, target, target. Okay. So then I went to a company called Del Reno. This is another Toronto company. Some of you I know are old enough to remember WinFax. Anyone use WinFax? Okay. Anyone have no idea what the hell WinFax is? <laughs> the majority. Okay. Young crowd. So you know what a fax modem was? <laughs> <laughs> So, so basically it was software that allowed you to, instead of printing to your printer, could send the thing through a fax modem of, you know, on your computer and fax it directly. You didn't have to print and go to the fax machine. And they basically invented that market on Windows. Um, and it was, they, they grew and they were, uh, they were uh, public, etc. It was a really uh, good thing. So you know, they had a great strategy, right? It was, they, they were early market. They were, in fact, they were the market you know, creator. Product worked. They had a light version bundled with every, pretty much every single uh, fax one manufacturer. They had lots of adoption, and they had a good name. You know, it's random Windows, WinFax, it's easy to remember. And they wanted to enter and reproduce success in the Macintosh market. And, and that's where I, I came in. I was part of a small team. So, tiny team, actually. <laughs> there, was, there was three of us. <laughs> I was this guy. There was a developer named Don, and there was a, a QA guy named Michael. And the company at the time was probably... 400 people, so there was like we were less than one percent of, of the company. And but you know they had, they had this really successful strategy, and they followed the same thing as they did on Windows. So they're going to bundle with fax modem manufacturers. They had the light version. They leveraged their Windows strength and name recognition, and the product was called WinFax Mac. <laughs> see, see, exactly. Thank you. I'll tell you a story. And then this was a concern. One of the constraints we had was everything, software, docs, etc., had to fit on one. 800K floppy disk. And, and for those of you who don't know what a K is, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, for those of them who don't know what a floppy disk is. Is that the same iPhone? Yeah. So 
it's it's eight a k is a thousand bytes basically so you know it's less than a megabyte of, of space so everything software and we have to make really interesting decision like if we add this feature it's going to be this much code but then it's going to add these many pages of the doc and are we going to go over I was it was really weird so so I'll tell you this so so it, this was a Windows company this was like deep Windows kind of culture I was writing Windows <coughs> Uh, sorry, I was writing Macintosh documentation on a Windows PC. <laughs> like, they wouldn't let me use a Mac to write the Mac DOS. So, WinFax Mac, we're in, <laughs> we're in, I'm so glad you guys are laughing because this is, we were in a, we're in a cross-functional meeting and there was a product manager and uh, he announced that we've done all this research or whatever, I don't know what the hell he said, but we're going to name it WinFax Mac because up until that time we had some code name. And so like my job was okay, search and replace, WinFax Mac, and you know, the, the splash screen has to be changed and all this stuff. And and Don and, and Michael and I are kind of looking at each other and going, that's not a good name. And Don, who was like the lead, Don goes, Yeah, I don't think I don't think you should name WinFax Mac. Especially at that time, because that was like the height of the Mac PC thing, and Win Anything Mac was a bad name. And the product manager was like, nope. We've done our research, and this is it, and we're extending our brand, and blah, 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 blah. So he comes back, and so we, fine, whatever. You're the product manager. We change it. I had the easy brick guys. I was just search and replace. Uh, six weeks later, he comes back and says, yeah, our beta testers have been telling us it's not really a great name. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my god, how stupid are you? Like, you need beta testers to tell you this. Like, you're the product manager. So here's what happened. First of all, it's product fail. So, WinFax Mac is a very bad name. So it's changed to Delrina Fax Pro for Macintosh, <laughs> which is, and you have to refer to it as Delrina Fax Pro for Macintosh. Why? Why do we have to refer to it that way? Well, yeah, but there's an even worse reason. It's something else called Fax Pro. Yes. <laughs> it was already a product called Fax Pro. Uh, there was like zero domain knowledge in the company. So at another meeting, uh, so a lot of people in the company didn't see the product until they read my docs. So that was their first exposure to the product that was being built. And, and uh, they didn't know Mac terminology at all. So, and the way you use it back then, it's different now obviously in the Mac, but you'd, you'd go in the chooser and you'd pick the, the device, which is the fax modem, and then you'd print to that device. And so, Someone's reading the docs and they see this, and then someone would say, I have a question. And yes, and it's like, what's this finder and chooser thing? Who named it that? Can we change it? It doesn't sound good. Like and I'm looking at Don and Michael, and then Don goes, No, it's fundamental to the operation of Macintosh. And, and the way he said that, I was like, He said that sentence 50 times, like for other questions. So, yeah, no domain knowledge. They were late to market because you know what? Like they've been in the Windows market for years. It's not like the Macintosh market was like, "What's a fax?" Right? These other players were there, and there was no really no major differentiation of their product. There was some cool stuff. We had some interesting features, but there was no reason for switching. Right? So you know, you, you, well, the name is probably the least of the problems. Right? They had no knowledge. They were late to market. All the fax vendors were tied up. You had no real go-to-market strategy. How are you going to display? And so the lesson learned was, you know, first of all, copycat strategies rarely work, right? Just because it worked once doesn't mean it's going to work again. The main knowledge is critical. And executives listen to your people. Like the fact that they weren't listening to us. We were the only three people who actually used the Mac in the company. And I was the least of the people in, in authority. The fact that they didn't listen to Don was what blew me away. So interesting story. I blogged about this like 14 years later in a blog post on domain knowledge, and I use this because I think it's a great story. And I didn't, I didn't slam anybody. I didn't name names or anything. But the internet being what it is, somebody from Delrina or ex Delrina read my blog, and boy, the shitstorm that <laughs> <laughs> like all these Delrina people started commenting, you know. And one guy, one guy like attacked me on the blog, like. You were a contractor or something. You were only there for a short period of time. You don't know the success. No. And I was just like, dude, you guys shut that operation down 18 months later. Like, that's all you need to say. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. And I found this. So, you know, the internet is great. This was, this was, it brought back the abuse. This is what it looked like. Uh, but, yeah, it seemed like great. Like, 
What were they thinking? All right, next. So then I moved on to a startup in Toronto. Uh, it was a data visualization startup. It was really cool 3D, real-time visualization of financial data. <laughs> it was venture funded. We, we had some great uh, people. Everyone loved our demos. So we ran on SGI, Silicon Graphics workstations at the time, which were like the, the graphic workstations. And everyone would just crowd around our, our, our booth. I, my title was manager of customer education, so I kind of got you know, out of strictly technical, uh, technical writing, and so I had responsibility for customer support and training and, and, and uh, docs as well. Um, and, and one of our founders, he would always talk about 4D. We represent data in four dimensions. So it's 3D plus time, but you know, <laughs> like it just sounded dumb. Um, but you know, these, are, these are, and again, I'm not talking about the internet, this is 1995, but I found these. These are the actual, some of the visualizations we had. So this is one, I won't go into it, I, I remember, but you know, there it is, visual decisions. Um, and then, you know, this was real time currency and other data. And this thing was a dynamic 3D representation mm -hmm. and you could get, you know, the underlying text by pointing at stuff. Uh, this was another one, I, I don't remember what this was. And this is one for, again, this is more, it says, Oh, what if analysis? Yeah, so, but we had the maps and we had the walls and, and so this is what we want to do. So we built a class library. So, you know, it's, it's a development tool that leveraged, and, and I remember this explicitly, it was a simple object-oriented platform independent interpretive proprietary language. So we, we created our own language that was sort of a simplified version of C++, um, and then customers would, would learn to use it. Uh, we had some good customers. We had, the first customer we had was this bank in Japan that came for like two weeks and I trained them. We had the NSA, so that's the <laughs> NSA in the US. They were a weird bunch. I, I'm serious. It was like, like they all had different cards. Nowhere did it say NSA. When you phone them, the, someone says Shark Tank. <laughs> and you're like, uh, is Fred there? Who's calling? Say so kind of, you know, hold on. And then about 30 seconds later, I'll transfer you. <laughs> um, NASDAQ. So, you know, we, we had the proprietary language view as a problem because it wasn't the language, it was an easy to use language, but we couldn't integrate with anything if we wanted to integrate apps. So we rebuilt everything to support C. And so, what happened? Massive adoption. Sorry? Massive adoption. Massive adoption, okay. I, I, I might throw you this, but. Anyone else? Yes. I want to say I'm sorry? I want to say that Just because he said massive adoption? <laughs> <laughs> if, if it didn't tank, it would still be around, right? Yeah, not necessarily. One of our competitors was called a company called ABS. They were advanced visual systems, and they're not around, and they're doing okay. But you're absolutely right. Uh, it was here. So it was, it was a fail. And it was a fit, like, okay, so first of all, we did literally everything wrong. Like, literally everything. So, you know, I wasn't the product manager at this time. Well, let me say that first. We had a product manager. <laughs> Remember, I was the manager of customer education. We had a product manager who only basically followed the VP of engineering around and I don't know what the hell he did. Super nice guy, but I don't know what the hell he did. There was no market validation. It's really whatever the VP wanted to build, we'd build. And, you know, what he wanted to build, Nobody wanted, right? Cool demos doesn't mean there's a market need. Yeah. We had crowds around our booth. It was, you know, it was nice, but people didn't want to create. We called them landscapes and complex visualizations. Someone said, hey, can you do pie charts? <laughs> <laughs> no. So, we walked away. And we added pie charts. But, uh, didn't help. Uh, so, you know, this is called field of dream syndrome. If you build it, they will come. We had uh, a CEO, so we had the two founders actually uh, couldn't get along after a while, the board removed them, one of them left, one of them stayed on. We got this other guy, <laughs> I swear to you, he, he was like the personification of the point here, Boston Dilbert. He was a short, somewhat stout, balding individual who didn't know anything about anything. And how little he knew, we found out when he, so I was responsible for training, and we didn't have a lot of customers, so you know, when we get something, we'd schedule a training course. And he said, Said, you know, why don't we just schedule them regularly? It's easier for sales reps to book something, and if you don't get enough, we'll just cancel the class. Okay, no problem. So we had a little internal website, and I 
next three months, we'll do them every two weeks. And, then, uh, and so I sent them an email. I said, hey, here's the link. Can you take a look? Is this OK, or do you want more? And then I get a response back like five minutes later. He goes, um, yeah, it's OK, but how come you only scheduled one class? I'm like, and this is 1995, right? So we're using Netscape, and browsers weren't good. And, I'm like, okay, I know. And then I go, okay, I hit refresh, hit refresh. Like, he goes, no, it's still, I don't see anything. I don't, okay, I'm going to walk over. And I remember this thing, and I'm looking at it, I go, oh, yeah, just scroll down. <laughs> and he's like, what? I, no, scroll down. Yeah, that's like, because he had a Mac, and it was a small screen. So I'm like, here, give me your hand, put on the mouse, scroll down. And he's like, oh, okay, this is great. I swear to you, I swear to you that's true. And I walked back over, because we, we, we were in another part of the floor, and I walked back over, and I just look at my face, this guy Nick goes, what happened? I go, you're not going to believe <laughs> And we started looking for work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, sorry, just remember, he could not get the company name right, and this is a true story. So the company was called Visible Decisions. Now, we had the unfortunate sort of thing that the initials of the company were VD. <laughs> But he would call it visual decisions. And we couldn't figure out why. And like he, we were trying to raise money, and we couldn't raise money. And it's like, so he's going to VCs and like, I think you should invest in visual decisions. They're probably going, let's go find out what that company is, because this company, <laughs> visual decisions, is not the company we're going to invest in. Right? But you know, what we learned there was creating new markets is hard. We're trying to do something new and different. And, and we had this huge step function and, you know, and, and all the other stuff. like. You know, know your market. This is a this oh, and change is a, this is another thing I learned. Change is a process, not an event. Change takes time. Yeah. People think, oh, we'll do it and everything will be great. This is actually a Dilbert from that time. <laughs> yeah. And and this when we work there. And I won't read it to you, but how great part of the design. And and it, it ended with you know he's talking to marketing and what should we build, and then he goes, I could write a program that makes fish appear on a computer screen. And when we saw this, we were just like, oh my god. Because two weeks earlier, we'd been in a meeting, and this guy, by the way, his name is Brian. Brian, the CEO, did not believe in market research. So he's like, give me ideas, give me ideas. And I'd propose, oh, I'm going to do some research. And his response was, well, by the time you research it, you can build something. Um, but then someone said, because who remembers flying toasters? Remember that screen screen? <laughs> someone goes, why don't we just build a... 3D visualization screensaver, because everyone wants that. And then we saw this. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, a lot of people want that. So anyway, so then I'm like, I'm out of here. It took me a while. Oh, by the way, I wanted a product management job, because I, I could do better than the guy we had. So Saeed gets a product management job. And yeah, you're waiting, like, when the hell did this guy have to come across it? <laughs> so, I was so, a technical writer too, so I know that feeling. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. My people as well. Um, yeah, so I applied, and I, uh, it's a long story, but I applied to one product management job, and I got it. And I was like, couldn't be easier. Um, but I, 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 it was a good company, it was about 70 people. And one reason they hired me, because they had these charting products, and I had this visualization background, so you know, I, had, I had domain experience. Um, so it's a very profitable company. The product I was given, though, was not was was this Unix product that was kind of a legacy product. But it was in, in that late, you know, what stage is that late stage? Milk it. Milk it. I'm not going to give you a three. Milk it. Company, but the company was not investing in product because it was 1997 and the internet was young, and they were investing in Java because Java was the place to be. So we also had an upstart, lower price competitor, which didn't help. The market for this wasn't growing, it was probably shrinking. Uh, companies were, you know, customers starting to move to Java. All Kale, so Kale Group was the name of the company, all our sales reps were focusing on Java because that was where the future was. Right? But, but this product was funding the Java investment. <coughs> so my job was increase profitability so we can fund the new products. That's, so again, you're the product manager, what do you do? And you're free to ask questions. But yes? Cut the cost. <coughs> Cut cost, okay. Anything else? Any other? Find ways to satisfy your customers and new ways that huge costs. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, you have two options: spend less or make more. Yeah. Right. This was my first product management job. What do you think I was going to do? Spend less. Create a new product. Well, I wasn't going to spend less. <coughs> but, that, that, 
hey, what you achieve in your job? Oh, I cut costs on my product by 30%. Oh, okay, you're hired, you know, for my next job. So what I did was, you know, cut costs from increased revenue. We didn't actually have a lot of costs to cut because they weren't investing in it, right? There's very limited marketing budget. Uh, we had some marketing, and then we, this was a time, and some of you may not be aware, but we used to ship things in boxes to people. <laughs> you know, software was sold in boxes and discs. Uh, and my dev team was tiny, and this was a, probably a $6 million product at the time, so you know, it's like, hey, like $2 million per developer, like, not bad. So I did some analysis, and I basically did the sales were not focusing on, not, they weren't just not selling our product, but they were not even following up on the leads. Because they're like, and I talked to them, and they said, well, you know what, like the future's Java, and that's where the CEO is focused, and I'm going to, you know, go there, and that's where all, we're going to Java 1 and doing all these things. And so, you know, I, I said, look, I went to, I went to management, I said, this is the case, and so we did put a dedicated quota on this product, because people aren't even, you know, doing it, or get some dedicated sales reps, right? That was my, that was my solution. And then the question was, you know, could we add some value without heavy investment? That was the other thing. And, and we did a little bit, we tweaked things, but we didn't actually have a lot, because these guys were both mostly maintenance. So what do you think happened? Thumbs up, thumb down. Did it succeed or did it fail? Succeed, <laughs> How many succeed? Okay, how many fail? How many people have arms? <laughs> okay. Not many of you have arms. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and lowering the price was not an option because we were trying to fund, you know, so because the market wasn't growing, so lowering the price wasn't you know, going to help. So, huge fail. Okay. So management would not put a quota or dedicate sales reps, right? They, the VP of sales is like, we're not, we can't do that. We can't say you have to get 20% of your quota from a single product. They sell, they sell, they're, they're, they've got a target. We're not gonna, because that hamstrings them. Then the CEO wanted no distractions from the Java growth. So I moved to a Java product management job. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't anything happening there. And, but here's the thing, no new PM was assigned to that product. And I said to my boss, who was a great guy, his name was Dwayne, and he was, he, was, he was like a mentor, and he said, look, either I've done such a great job that this thing runs itself, or I added absolutely no value, so you don't need to replace me. And uh, apparently I added value because sales plummeted 20% over two quarters. Like, they just, they just tanked. So guess what happened then? Management noticed. And so then we were <coughs> successful because they panicked. Right? And so they asked me to find a solution. I was like, I already gave you a solution. So I basically reproposed my original plan of data paid sales rep, but then I, I kind of socialized them more with sales. And, and what I found was there was a couple of sales that were like, I don't care how I make money, I'm going to make money. And if I get this product and I got $6 million of revenue to build, I, I can make way more money than what I'm doing there. And some, some, some people were like, yeah, you go sell that, we'll sell Java. So, so they, the two guys went and they got there. They actually decided to hire a product manager because the, the other feedback was, why aren't you selling XRT? Well, because management didn't put a product manager on it, so it couldn't be important. So, you know. So, Jace, that's the value add of product management. Okay. Just being there. So, lesson learned, right? It's not enough to be. So, this is what I learned from myself. I was, I was correct. I was academically correct. It was the right thing to do, but I didn't really kind of, you know, socialize it and do the right things. <coughs> so I didn't sell the ideas and drive it, right? But then on the other hand, it's like, yeah, you know, not listening to me cost them like half a million dollars, so. Um, and then, you know, product managers are valuable. I learned that. Okay, we'll go through a couple more. How much time do I have, Jace? Five, five minutes, okay, I'll do one more. <laughs> <coughs> so then, then I moved to California. I moved in 2000. In fact, I moved in March 2000. Who knows what happened in March 2000? Internet Sorry? Internet yeah, the NASDAQ reached its peak and then started going down. So it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think we got there the week it reached its peak. Uh, so, but I, you know, in 2002, I ended up at this company it's, uh, called Informatica. It's about 250 million uh, revenue. It was a public company at the time. It had gone public a couple years earlier. Rock solid product. I was a lead PM for the main product. It was great. This is a huge step up in my career. Uh, I'd never worked in a company this size before. We had a thousand customers or something. It was, it was, it was a great place to be. 
Um, we had, the thing was there's a very strong technical culture in the company. Like, it was really technology driven. In fact, I overlapped by two weeks the guy I was replacing. His name was Alan, really good guy, and I said, why, why are you leaving? Because, you know, it was good, right? It was because of the VP of engineering. And he, said, like, he, he said something like, I can't work in a place where he's going to stunt my career. And I was like, I didn't really know the dynamics, and I thought maybe they had some, some issues. Um, but anyway, I butted heads with him quite often on products and releases and planning and all that stuff. And I have to say, I mean, he was a rock solid guy. He was a very good VP, but he also had very strong opinions. And one of his opinions was, product managers shouldn't be telling me what to do. <laughs> um, anyway, so how do you deal with this? And this is something that happens, right? You, you, you get in these situations, and guess what? Like, you're the product manager, and you've got this whole organization that you have to work with, but deal with. Anyone been in this situation? OK. How did you deal with it? I'm sorry? Talk, OK. Anyone else? Someone here had their hand? Yes? Just showing them what's in it for them. OK, good. So. That's, that's, yeah. Speak their language. Speak their language, OK. Bottom up management. Bottom up management. So leave from the bottom and then go up. OK. All all, all, those are all great answers, and you, you, you've all. You, you, you've got a engineer a win win solution. Yes. Either you've got to yeah. go, or you, you've got to. Yeah. yeah, able to yeah. both exist. Yeah. By the way, I realized later on that I'd started off on the wrong foot because I think I was there a week, and this one engineer comes up to me and says, hey, Saeed, uh, can you help me? I go, yeah, sure, what? He goes, um, we need to get the latest version of HP UX. I'm like, okay. And I'm just like, okay, what, this, like, what are you asking? And he goes, well, Alan used to do this for us. Alan was a previous product manager. And I'm like, okay, so I'm not Alan, and that's not a product manager job. So I think I probably you know didn't win any friends, but but it's like that's not my job. <coughs> Sorry, I'm not your gopher. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say when I've uh, been in a situation, it's been the uh, their interpretation of your role. Yes, and, exactly. And, and usually you got to sit down and go, "This is what I do. This yeah. is what you do. Yeah. Look, let's just get clear." Yeah. On, yeah. On yeah. I, I and and my wife will you know vouch for this. I tend to not be as empathetic as I should be. <laughs> <laughs> Although I've learned, I've been married 20 years, so I've learned. Congrats, 25. Um, feels like 20. So, what did I do? Well, first of all, I did my job. I had a job, I had a big job. You know, 80% of the revenue was my product. And I was the only product manager at the time. We got more. But I tried to be nice. Um, but I held my ground was important. And that was, again, part of my job. Right? And when, when we, there was a big meeting, and one time I got into a big argument with that, that VP, and he stormed out. And everyone looked at me and said, like, oh. And uh, I was right. <laughs> but I got passed over for promotion. And it was very, very obvious. And, and in fact, someone came up to me and said, Sai, how come you didn't get promoted? You know. And then after being passed over a second time. Who did I promote um, product managers to? I'm sorry? What, what's the promotion for a product manager? So there were different levels. So oh. there was like, you know, there was a product manager, senior product manager, principal product manager, then it was director and senior director <laughs> and all that, right? So I was, I was senior product manager. I should have gotten up one level. Yeah, so, but after the second time, I left. So product manager and engineering reporting to the same, same GM, right? So he was responsible for both, but that VP of engineering was pretty influential. Lesson learned, so build bridges and remove blockers. I, I tried to build bridges, but I didn't remove blockers. And blockers were, like, I should have really had a heart-to-heart -heart with that VP and sort of worked it out and mm. never did. Uh, learn to manage up, so someone said at the back, right? So you, everyone know what managing up is? I, I don't see every head nodding. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I have a story about managing up, and then I'll finish. So being right does not mean you are right. And this is, this again, I should have learned that at the, uh, you know, previous company, Kale Group, but uh, anyway. So I'll tell you, that, I'll finish it with this story. So you all know who Pythagoras was, right? You know, Pythagoras Triangle. So he was a mathematician, and he was a philosopher, and he was many things, and a very intelligent guy. And, and part of his philo philosophy was that he thought, he was a rationalist. He thought everything could be explained, and everything could be determined, and, and that there was no, like, ambiguity in things in the world. And so one of his students... Uh, name, I think it was Hippasus or Hippasus, something like that. He actually showed that, like, if you take a right angle triangle and it's one and one, 
The hypotenuse is? Root 2. Root two. Right. That, that's worth. Who was that? All right. <laughs> Could have been Indian. Uh, so it's root 2. And he showed him that root 2 is irrational. Right? So irrational means it's got never ending, never repeating series of decimals. You can't represent it as a fraction of integers. And, and this blew Pythagoras' mind because this totally upended his philosophy. So what did Pythagoras do? He's a brilliant guy. He knows all this stuff. Anyone? Extended the... Extended his philosophy. Real numbers to... Kicked him out of class. Kicked him out of class, okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Okay, so you're the closest? He had him drowned. <laughs> <laughs> he had some other student take him out to sea and drown him. Wow. So that was like the example of not managing up well. <laughs> so that's, you know, know, know what your bosses think and understand them and help them in their goals. Don't, don't go in the opposite direction. All right, so I'll, I'll stop there. Any questions? Yes. Uh, just on that one. <coughs> there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of talk about product managers should have all the responsibility without authority. And that's been something I've... Who, who said that? Oh, I've just read a lot of PM, especially product owner type yeah. things as well, because like PMs is big product owners. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, you should be able to manage through influence and yeah. know the customer. Yeah. And, yeah. But at the end of the day, if your dev team is like, well, we're passionate about this tech, or we want to build this thing, yeah. or... Yeah. It's... Because it's, I come from games industry, they might go, well, we'll have an executive producer, and you're equal yeah. to the VP of engineering, yeah. and yeah. just play nice and... Yeah. I just want it to work out. Yeah. But I'm just interested to get your thoughts on it. Yeah, no, that, that's a good question. That, that's, that's the day old, uh, the age yeah. old thing, right? I remember saying in that first job in 1997. So here's the thing, there's different types of authority, right? There's, there's positional authority, which is what people think about, and then there's you know, authority through, through sort of reputation, right? So there's people who, you know, they don't tell you what to do, but you follow them, or there's influential authority, right? And, and as product managers, we can't be positional authority because we're cross-functional. Right? Otherwise, we are literally the head of the company, and that's definitely not the case. And, 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 and bringing people into alignment is not about telling them you have to fall into place, right? So, so I, I think that, that phrase, you know, all the responsibility and the authority is not true. And, and I'll say from my first product manager job, I learned it very quickly because the guy who was doing my job before me was the CEO. He was a founder, and he had built that product up, and he had, you know, he had other things to do in Java. And like a month in, like the head, we had a European office, probably about 10 people, and his name is Peter, and Peter's over, and he's like, hey, Peter, you know. He's like, Sight, I need your help. I go, sure. He goes, we have this problem in Europe, and I, I, I need you to help me. And I'm like, the hell, I've been here a month. I don't even know anything about the operation in Europe. But by, by you know, sort of inference, like, well, he's taking over Greg's job, and he's the product manager, and so they gave me that authority. And, and, and what I found is that in most companies, people understand that, and you have the authority until you give it up. Mm. Mm. And when you give it up, it's gone. <laughs> Someone else will take it, right? Because you're not doing your job. So I, I think it's important to remember that you do have authority. It's not positional authority. But you have to work at it. And so, yeah, leading by influence, absolutely. Building consensus. Having a vision. And building, you know, kind of people behind you to, into that vision, right? That, that, those are really important things. So that's the way I look at it. No, oh, at the very back. Sorry, it's not a question, it's a statement. Sorry, I know I speak as this kind of thing. But we started off with everybody struggling with organizational alignment. Mm -hmm. And it feels like most of the talk has been explaining it to us. So, great job. Has been, sorry, what? <laughs> explaining the importance of organizational alignment. Yeah. Like all the other stuff, that all, that's all straightforward. We all talk about that all the time. Yeah. Mm. But at the end of the day, it's about what, what you're saying. Yeah. At its very core, is yeah. you need to find how to work <coughs> with everybody else. Yeah. So one thing I've done in every single company I've worked at, and I learned it in my first job, in my first product manager job, is take charge of the cross-functional meeting, the, the weekly or bi-weekly or whatever cross-functional meeting. Get those people in there. You represent each department. Keep them informed. Help them solve their problems. Mm -hmm. You know, add value. And, and, and you're, you're, you're suddenly getting all that sort of influential authority, and people look at you, oh yeah, you know, he or she, you're, you're doing the thing you need to do, and you're, you're keeping everyone alive. 
So that's I mean that's one simple tactic, but there's there's more. Someone else, yeah. So uh, if you go back to your story about alias, and you said that the guy from person, yeah, Peter. His name is Peter. Peter. I, I took yeah. a. Oh, I don't think I'm going to use any of this. So specific. But he took a single product, yeah. and then broke it into, yeah. into many products, and that was successful. Yes. What was that? Just a gamble on his part, and it just happened to pay off, or was it a very well educated uh, kind of gambit, I suppose, and, and he knew it was going to succeed. Like, so, and, and how did he work out what okay. was going to succeed or not? Okay, so I, 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 I was a technical writer then, I was involved in discussions, but basically, and so I don't know exactly the methodology, but basically they said, look, we've got two markets, they're, they're different, we need to figure out how to split our product across those two markets. And then they looked at some of the capabilities of the product. So like we had animator and power animator. Why do we have a light, you know, not light, but a lower version, a higher version? Because the, the studios, yeah. film studios had different needs, right? They didn't always need power animator. So it was kind of here's, we can get into the market with animator and then, you know, they can upgrade if they want the power animator or the high end ones, they just want power animator. So it was, it was, you know, that kind of analysis. I don't know the specifics because I wasn't involved. You know, I saw the output essentially. Is it almost like, I mean, could you imagine it being like a functional decomposition of software and then these markets need these different functions and therefore it just kind of falls out? So, yeah, but I would look at it from the other way around. So it's, it's, you start with what the market needs are and then you decide what the functional decomposition is and mm -hmm. then you say, what, where are the gaps and how do we adjust the gaps and so on, and then you have a vision. I'm getting the hook. So. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Saeed, for sharing Thanks. those stories. And I just wanted to give you a small token of uh, gratitude. Our new set chocolate oh product, Australian product, and uh, take that back to your family as you fly thank back you. tomorrow. And uh, let's call it, give, give Saeed a round of applause.